Well, hello everyone and welcome back to the fourth session of our Keep Thriving Wellbeing Conference 2022. Uh, I'm Stephen Cook, I am the Head of Policy and Communications at the British Safety Council. I'm chairing the conference today. And this session is going to be on financial well-being in the workplace. So I hope you enjoyed your lunch break. We have lots to look forward to this afternoon. So uh, I hope you can keep joining us for our next four sessions that we have today. Uh, but for our first, we have a double bill. We'll be hearing from both Jeremy Milton, uh, who's Principal Defined Contribution and Financial Wellness Commercial Leader at Mercer Marsh Benefits, and David Reeford. He's also a partner at Mercer Marsh Benefits. Jeremy has been part of Mercer's specialist financial wellbeing team since it started up in 2015. He now leads on developing consulting and service solutions and capabilities around financial wellbeing to support clients to develop effective programs of their own. David is a partner in Mercer's career business, helps clients get the most out of their career and reward programs. And David assists organizations through major change, helps clients navigate complex and ever-changing employment law. So Jeremy and David, welcome to you both uh, and over to you. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as Steve says, welcome back for, for, for lunch. Um, we're gonna split the um, session over the next 40 minutes or so into two parts. I'm just gonna start off by setting a little bit of, of background um, to really where we see financial well-being in the workplace, uh, particularly some of the impacts we've had um, as a result of the COVID pandemic, which we're all um, very excited to still be living through, um, but also some of the headwinds that we're potentially now seeing coming out of the, the cost of living crisis that is going to impact us all and, and putting that through the employee lens and some of those emerging challenges over the next 12 to 24 months. I'll then hand over to David, who's going to uh, take a a slightly step back and look at the wider kind of value proposition and, and people and well-being strategies in, in a post-pandemic world. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, I'd just like to start by really kind of explaining the, the framework we take when we're, we're working with organisations to help them either start or, or develop or improve their, their financial well-being programme. Uh, and we use a model that really considers um, kind of four elements that are key as individuals to our own financial well-being and our longer term financial resilience. So we start off uh, top left looking at, at people being able to manage um, through the day to day. So simple things like budgeting, making money last if possible to the end of the month, um, trying not to over rely on debt. But, but we all know that that is, is a pretty big part of a lot of people's and a lot of the workforce's uh, financial management, uh, particularly these days and particularly post-pandemic. Um, we then start to think about people being, being able to build that kind of baseline uh, resiliency, being able to deal with, with a financial shock of, of which, again, many employees either directly or perhaps through their household have experienced um, in the pandemic world, but, but can apply at any time. We then kind of move along, if you like, to that future view, which is, is people starting to build that level of financial resilience and, and ideally reaching a point where they have some element of freedom to start making choices and, and build for plans that, other than just managing the day to day through to what we call on track for the future, which I, I guess is the traditional retirement space, the pension planning space, which indirectly, whether we called it that or not, was a core part of most organizations financial well-being programs historically and, and, and we use this when we think about the employee needs uh, and that also helps to inform from the corporate perspective actually the areas where you might want to look to help or, or at least review where you're helping and supporting employees both through education but also perhaps through programs that are part of your benefit arrangements that are used to support employees at different stages or who are facing different challenges um, with, within these four elements of personal financial well-being. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. And as I mentioned, it, it's impossible still to talk about or to not talk about COVID and, and pandemic. Hopefully this time uh, we, we are out of the woods and we can start um, to think from a business perspective about some degree of normality, except in many things I think we all recognise have, have changed 
um, perhaps forever. But again, if we think about employee journeys, and this will vary from organisation to organisation, we've got, I guess, the broader aspects of wellbeing all coming into play. Um, both still concerns over physical and, and health, although we hope we're past the, the, the worst of, of the COVID pandemic and those more direct health challenges. I think from a social perspective in many organisations, um, both the organisations and individuals are, are perhaps struggling with what the, the, the new normal looks like, particularly organisations perhaps where there will be more of a shift towards hybrid working and, and some of the challenges and benefits that that brings. And I think back to our, our financial challenge, which is our main focus of, of this part of the session, many people have, have, have suffered quite significant financial challenges over the last 12, 18 months. And those problems, those issues are still likely to continue, perhaps for different reasons, over the coming 12 or 24 months. And it's really important, but I think encouraging to see that, that actually many organisations, nearly two thirds of organisations, did take positive steps and produce or provide additional support for their employee workforce during, I guess, the thick of the pandemic. Um, the top, top right stat, I think, speaks to us all, um, the, the recognised importance of wellbeing and perhaps the amplification that we've seen coming through um, the pandemic itself. But I think if, if we kind of start looking forward, whilst COVID perhaps has acted as a catalyst, to see financial well-being really join the well-being family. There are, for, for many organisations, perhaps some way to go uh, until their financial well-being strategies are perhaps as supportive of their more traditional physical uh, and, and mental health programmes that they currently operate. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. And I think one of the, the interesting things we're starting to see from some of the data coming out of the back of uh, of, I guess, the, the whole pandemic period, is that certainly through the latter part of 2020 and into 2021, we actually started to see a polarisation happening between middle or higher earners and, and lower earning elements of, of the workforce. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, perhaps from, from your own experiences, but, but some people were lucky enough to actually see their savings uh, increase by a pretty phenomenal amount, over 140 billion over the first year of the pandemic and, and for many people if they were working from home they didn't have traditional travel um, and lunch expenses all of those type of things not being able to go on holiday actually saw an indirect positive benefit um, to people and that is quite pronounced that that benefit or that uplift tends to have happened in, in the middle and higher earning populations we started to see some evidence um, in the back end of 2021 i guess as, as we were going through various stages of un unlocking um, that actually there was this pent-up demand and, and obviously has, has fueled some of the, if you like, the consumer-led uh, recovery that we've seen in the UK. Um, but there is evidence that as we've moved through the second part of last year and, and we expect this trend to continue through 2022, we're actually starting to see an increase in debt, uh, particularly amongst lower earning employees, or more importantly, if they did have savings that they built up or had pre-pandemic, those are increasingly starting to get used to help manage some of their day-to-day -day financial challenges. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, if, if we move ahead for, for perhaps some of those uh, challenges from the, the cost of living crisis, whatever label you want to give, the, the challenges around energy, the challenges on, on pay rises, increases relative to the headline inflation rate, particularly at, at the moment, the outlook for many employees is going to be a continuous one of struggle over the next one to two years. And I think, again, if, if COVID was perhaps a catalyst for many organisations coming back to say, look, we, we do need to support our people, you know, in, in better ways or in, in more effective ways. And this isn't just about giving everyone a big pay rise to try and fix the problem recognizing that, that a different set of challenges are now going to be impacting quite quite large portions of workforce we think it's really important that organizations take time this year to look at what they're already doing for their workforce but more importantly to ask themselves that question how can we support our employees more effectively going forward now this isn't about just paying for loads of new benefits or, or doing you know, lots of other new programs that you introduce. It, it, it's a path perhaps to help employees become better equipped to help themselves. Um, and I'd like to look at on, on the next slide, um, 
something we launched last year, um, which is the Mercer Financial Wellbeing Index, um, which was a, a self-assessment tool that organizations can take to actually give them some sort of benchmark and rating on, on how their current financial wellbeing program and support um, it, it is set up and, and how it addresses those four areas, those four elements of well-being that I talked about at the beginning of the session. And a couple of, of key statistics I wanted to share from, from the findings of, of the index research. We've seen quite a significant change over the last five years um, from, from about 15% of organisations formally having a financial well-being strategy to over 35% um, as of last year when we carried out the research. And I think encouragingly and positively, three quarters of organizations are intending to develop a more formal FW program and an area of support to their workforce than they currently provide over the next five years. But I think one of the challenges that, that many organizations that we work with um, when we're helping them develop a, a financial well-being program is, is what are the real needs in your workforce? And, and we were quite surprised that nearly 85% of organizations have not done any real active listening with their workforce over what the particular areas of, of need or where those employees could, could benefit from the most support. Um, now, part of that might be that financial well-being and money is, is still considered a taboo subject by many organizations, and there's that kind of moral and philosophical position on, on engaging employees to, to talk about that. But we think that that is, is critically key um, in terms of informing what and where you might take as your next steps to start or to develop your financial well-being program. Um, and I know there's quite a few uh, stats on this slide, but in the bottom left, it, it's quite surprising that about 60% of organizations don't really know how their own workforce is faring, uh, whether they're all pretty comfortable or, or whether actually they've got large proportions of their workforce struggling with some of those day-to-day -day or, or debt-related issues. And I think understanding that is critical to inform the type of interventions or support that you can provide for the workforce going forward. Um, and if we can move on to the next slide, it's interesting to see that um, of the organisations that participated in, in, in the index, actually the highest area that, that most organisations are planning to do more of or to try and do better to support employees is still around that traditional core benefit of, of retirement education, retirement understanding. Now, part of that is influenced perhaps by older sections of the workforce, perhaps re-evaluating their future career paths. In many cases, we've seen uh, a lot of employees looking to either change their working patterns or perhaps to access their, their retirement benefits earlier than planned, possibly as some sort of bridging approach um, to a transition to longer term retirement or, or even in some cases to manage their day-to-day -to, -day, to manage help manage their day-to-day -day income requirements but i think if we look at those those four middle areas this again was one of the really encouraging things from the the index that, that many organizations are starting to recognize that that helping people to understand through education programs is really important whether that's helping them to, to manage their day-to-day -day spending and budgeting better or the importance of trying to, to manage debt effectively. And I, I guess once you've managed or overcome that barrier, being able to then look at, at building a, a buffer through some form of savings program. And, and incidentally, both the additional savings through the workplace and access to, to workplace debt solutions, whether that's loan consolidation or pay advance, are two of the most increasing trends that we've seen with between 25 and 30 percent of organizations now actively encouraging employees to save through the workplace if they're able or to help manage their debt perhaps in a more effective or cost effective way than some of those personal type loans that we we know are out there particularly uh, the, the old payday type high very high interest rate lending so whilst there's you know a journey to go on I think it's really encouraging that the majority of organizations are committing um, to do more to support employees over, over the coming two to three years. And, and taking that step forward for any organization is critical on, on starting to make that progress. So if I just turn to my last slide of, of this section, what we're, uh, what we're focusing on, I guess, is three questions uh, that you can ask as an organization amongst your benefits or leadership teams 
if you feel that, that supporting your employees in the financial wellbeing space is, is something that, that you want to do and that you're committing to do more of, is, is how that actually helps support your employees and how that aligns with your wider business objectives. And, and David's going to talk a little bit more about this in, in the second half of our, our section. And I think the other piece is, is what tone do you want to set, you know, to make people feel comfortable um, about talking about money in the workplace, but also recognizing that the employer is there, as they are in many other aspects of, of well-being, to support employees, make good decisions, and be able to take positive actions. Um, solutions, products, and services in some ways come later. I think understanding where you organizationally want to go is the key first step. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, that there's been a notable lack of listening and understanding really what are the priorities for employees, because that will help you inform through active listening, what are the first three or four things that you might want to focus your resource and your time on supporting people that will have the most direct, direct impact and benefit to the, lar the larger part of your workforce. And I think always with developing programs, it will be evolutionary. Um, so they're often quick, quick wins that you can take through looking at some of the benefits that you already provide and perhaps actively re-promoting those as you give your financial well-being strategy and programs that a clearer definition amongst your workforce if, if that's one of your goals for, for the next 12 or 18 months. So I'm now going to hand over to, to David and I know we'll come back to Steve for questions at the end and we'll, we'll pick up from either sections of our presentation uh, based on any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, perfectly to time, as I would have expected. Um, I'm, I've really got four themes that I want to talk about, and uh, and this is an opportunity, I think, to step back uh, from uh, some of the specifics uh, and look at some of the macro themes that are really affecting the way that companies are thinking about uh, what they do, how they're organized, uh, the workforces that they employ, uh, and the way that they employ them. And I think the connection here between what Jeremy is talking about is that, you know, yes, there's lots of great ways that uh, you can think about enhancing uh, individuals' sort of financial well-being through the through the solutions you provide as as well as the advice they give. But one of the ways is to ensure that what you're doing is offering them the opportunity to progress within a thriving environment uh, uh, where the organisation is succeeding. Um, so what I want to talk about is is really these four themes. There's something around what I call the rise in resilience, and that's the focus on organizations, um, which has been there for many years, but thinking it at the moment in terms of how did we react uh, when the pandemic struck, and what is it about resilient organizations um, that ensures that they thrive uh, more than just surviving. The second thing is, is what we call the case for skills, um, and I think this is part of the fundamental change that organizations or many organizations are going through at the moment, which is principally around the need to be adaptive um, to the context that you're in uh, and the extent to which a sort of a, a hierarchy of fixed jobs is the way that you think about it or are there other ways. Uh, the third one, you know, uh, you've seen it all over the place, no doubt, is ESG and sustainability, uh, a really important theme for how organizations are responding to the environments that they, they work in, but also uh, flipping it in internally and saying, well, actually, if we are, um, uh, you know, uh, focusing on um, the sustainability around the societies that we impact on. How do we think about that in relation to our own employee population and even the employee populations in our supply chains uh, to ensure that what we're doing is the right responsible things? And the final one, which is, a, I guess, a theme that's been around for quite a while, but again, we had to rethink during COVID, which is this idea of uh, flexibility uh, and how does that extrapolate into perhaps broader themes of personalization uh, and how is that affecting uh, the employment proposition that we're giving to people. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a piece of research that we've been doing for years, um, which really looks at organisations that um, uh, are, are threatened at some point for a variety of reasons, and that might be because of product failures, it might be because of reputational damages, or it could even be natural disasters. And then you can look at the extent to which some organizations thrive in adversary and, and, and adversity and, and why others um, simply survive or, or don't even survive. Um, and uh, so this is work that's been done for many, many years, but I think it's, it's quite relevant to the sort of context that we've been in recently. 
Um, and the uh, evidence suggests that it almost boils down to sort of two primary reasons why organizations uh, thrive or survive. And the first is to do with this uh, sort of the, the health of the organization. Uh, and that is principally around uh, structural issues. Uh, and from an employment perspective, very much thinking about the talent pools that you look for or look into to draw people into the organization or even lose them too. And are there alternative ways of thinking uh, about the nature of that workforce? And in this sense, I think what we're seeing is organizations revert to what we saw perhaps in the 90s, uh, which is thinking really about sort of core workforce and peripheral workforces. And we've seen a sort of expansion of the gig economy and the extent to which actually workers might sit outside of the employment population. And we've even seen the definitions of employment start to blur now that we've got uh, what we call workers, employees and self-employed people. Um, and organizations thinking actually that you know, success doesn't lie in pure employment, but thinking more flexibly really about the way that we uh, engage uh, in a wider pool uh, of people outside the organization. Uh, and even thinking about what it is about the employment uh, or the, wor the working practices in, uh, in other talent pools that we can bring into the employment model. Because to date, there's been a sort of fairly binary decision for people to say, well, do I want to be an employee or, or self-employed? And we know that if you are employed, you probably cherish things like income predictability uh, and security. Um, and those people who are prepared to be more adventurous and, and look uh, for work to be um, you know, more flexible, varied, and fundamentally uh, allow them more autonomy might well go into um, alternative markets, gig type economy. And we've been working with organizations who are saying, well, we'd quite like to bring all of these things together into an employment proposition so that employees can have the security and the predictability of income. But also what we're doing is transforming the nature of work such that uh, you know, it becomes uh, more flexible, more varied, uh, and gives people more autonomy over the way that they work. Um, so I think that you know, what we're seeing is some changes in that respect. The second thing is you know, how organizations behave uh, post-crisis. Um, and in these particular cases, what you tended to find was a clear distinction between the thrivers and the survivors. Um, the, survi uh, the survivors tended to uh, res you know, re return to type, which is often to think about uh, going into command and control as a way of resisting the threats that come along. But the thrivers um, behave very differently. They often open up channels of control. They, they push responsibility into the organization to the work face uh, where people can respond uh, to, the, uh, to the issues um, uh, and dissolve barriers between, um, between parts or segments of the organization. And that allows for a much more agile, responsive um, uh, reaction to whatever threats uh, come along. Um, and I think we saw much of that and flavors of that uh, through COVID. Um, organizations that we were talking to across the period have often said um, that fundamentally we had to trust people and that trust has returned the favor in, in many respects. And we think that what we will do is, is have a very um, a more loosely governed uh, workforce with people being uh, trusted more to do um, uh, the work that, uh, that we would like them to do and they will have more autonomy in that respect. So I think we'll see some, uh, some changes in that respect going forward. Um, we're talking, as I say, to many organizations who are rethinking the proposition to some, uh, in, along those lines. If we can go to the next slide. So this is what we uh, call the case for skills. Um, and I think, you know, on the left, you've got lots of statistics. So you hear organizations like um, the World Economic Forum or the OECD saying that certain jobs will not be there in the future, uh, but different jobs will, will evolve. Um, and we can argue over the extent to which jobs get created or, or dissolved as a result of the introduction of new technologies or artificial intelligence. But we do know that the nature of work will change as a result of these things. Um, and I think there's another um, aspect here, um, which is uh, you know, what that's driving, I think, is a sense to which we can't rely on the concept of a job as being here today and here tomorrow in the extent, to the extent perhaps that we used to. Um, and uh, yes, we will still have jobs that are fixed in nature and similar in, in content to how they used to be, but increasingly we need to think about more agile ways of working, uh, different forms of team working, uh, more collaboration, and the extent to which what people do at work is less confined uh, or defined uh, within a concept of a job. 
and therefore we we believe that what organizations are moving towards if they wish to remain more agile and adapt to uh, the changes going on around them is that they'll start to rethink uh, that process so people not necessarily in fixed jobs um, they might we might actually need to refer to the skills and capabilities they bring and think more flexibly about how they apply those skills and capabilities back into the organization. Um, and I think there's a, there's a few other triggers around here which are quite interesting. And one is, you know, we've, we hear quite a lot or have done over the years, the idea that we pay for performance. Um, and often when you dig away at that, you, you might hear different perspectives within the same organization as to what that actually means. Uh, to some extent, uh, people will say, well, is it pay for performance? So is it base pay? Or do we reward somebody's uh, performance in, in other ways? So for instance, through incentives and so on. And, uh, uh, and there is also an extent to which people say, you know, is performance really the driver that we need to reward um, for the contributions that people make? Um, and we know quite a lot about the effectiveness of performance systems, and we know quite a lot about the way that re reward systems, particularly incentives, do or don't do the right sort of things. Um, and there's an extent to which actually the working environment, as it becomes more collaborative, is questioning whether the pay per performance culture is really driving the right sort of organizational outcomes. It sort of comes from a view that if you reward individuals for individual achievement, that collectively what you'll get is organizational performance. But I think uh, depending on the reward structures that are in place, you tend to find there is more of a tournament model around um, bonuses and career progression and uh, pay budgets. And actually the more you can think about how collaboration should be rewarded, uh, we believe takes you to a better environment whereby um, the right rewards will drive um, more uh, collective uh, and therefore business oriented outcomes. So we think that pay for performance is in decline and there is much more of a pay for skills or even a pay for progression type model such that individuals are uh, recognized for the extent to which they grow appropriate skills and capabilities in the way that they can demonstrate that those uh, bring value back into the organization. And that also deals with some of the issues that we see in pay for performance cultures, which is actually the performance management conversation, the, the goal setting, the ongoing discussions, and really the appraisal process at the end of the year get hijacked. Uh, we know they're already riddled with biases, but we also can see that there's game playing that goes on when there is a direct link uh, to the way that the, uh, the reward mechanisms are applied back. So we see that a pay for skills type model and, a, and an incentive for collaborative performance type model is working well in organizations that, um, that want to think differently about, about that model. If we can go to the uh, next slide. Um, it won't come as any surprise, we see a sort of ESG uh, or sustainability uh, coming to the fore quite, uh, quite predominantly at the moment, and this seems to be high on organizations' agenda. Uh, when they're thinking about their role in society uh, and the, the damage or whatever they do uh, towards climate uh, or the environment. Um, so it seems quite high on organizations priorities to think about what the impact is that they can make and how they can improve that impact. Um, and uh, fundamental to that is the question about how employees can contribute to that process. And we see that there are two main areas and we, perhaps we can call them sustainability and responsibility. Sustainability is really around how does the organization uh, make that difference? Uh, and what we see at the moment, um, because we can see it in sustainability reports, uh, and we know it from conversations that we're having with those organizations, is that there is a process whereby uh, those organizations will set themselves goals. Um, and fundamentally, they will be internal and external goals. The external goals tend to be about um, pollution, waste, CO2 emissions, uh, uh, and you know, reducing their reliance on uh, certain minerals, those sorts of things. And then there are also internal priorities, which are often linked to diversity and inclusion and well-being, i.e., the extent to which we can improve the proposition to our employees by thinking differently about what's important to them. Um, and um, we would argue so that this is, you know, quite a uh, quite a, an area of interest at the moment. So if employees uh, have those two areas to contribute, what is it that organizations can do about it? So if those goals are set for the organization, they often get distributed to the senior leadership team. So we know that, um, and we can see within the way organizations report, 
is that those goals and the measures associated with them do impact on the way that short and long term incentives are offered to uh, their senior leadership team. But we don't see very clearly how responsibility cascades into the organization. And we don't see very clearly how, again, the reward mechanisms, for instance, and, and other performance management systems will impact on the way uh, that employees can connect with those goals. Uh, or the way that the business um, sets uh, or organizes itself itself around those objectives. Do you need a, a head of sustainability with a sustainability function? Or is it really everybody's responsibility? And then how can you create a culture of sustainability? So these things are really important if the organization is to achieve its goals. And at the moment, we think that there is strong evolution in this area for businesses to think more thoroughly about how sustainability can be captured into the culture to the extent that it's reflected in the conversation and the everyday conversations that people have with those line managers and probably uh, reflected in the way that incentives are paid all the way down the organization. So at the moment we tend to find that um, incentives are heavily linked to organizational performance uh, and still as I said earlier largely linked to people's individual contribution to that success. And we think that organizations need to sort of untangle those a bit to ensure that a multi-stakeholder view is built around that and it might act as a factor that moderates the, the bonus budgets and so on to ensure that they, the message is really reinforced about the importance of sustainability. The second thing is this responsibility thing. And as I said earlier, it's really about ensuring that, um, that the company itself as an employer uh, takes the right sort of actions uh, towards its own employment population and potentially the employees within the supply chain. And here we see a whole uh, raft of different um, initiatives taken uh, by organizations, often linked to diversity and inclusion or well-being, uh, possibly linked to raising minimum standards as well. So conversations about living wage, conversations around minimum benefit standards that um, the organization believes it should be providing to its employees are all captured in this in this area. Typically in a programmatic way, increasingly we're seeing organizations think about these things in a more holistic way. Uh, and I think that's a very productive uh, uh, way forward. If we can go to the next slide, um, this is the my, fine, my fourth and final theme, is this issue around flexibility. Uh, and here, um, uh, perhaps a little bit of a history lesson. I think what we've had in uh, organizations sort of pre-COVID was this slow transition uh, towards flexibility. Um, we started advising, I guess, about 10 years ago around uh, flexible working practices, uh, spoke to lots of organizations, and on the whole, I would have said we would use uh, the term tolerated for flexible working practices. Um, they weren't really embraced or encouraged, and usually a response to uh, particular segments of the workforce, often women returning to work, then we will, uh, we will allow them uh, to work flexibly. Um, no clear definitions about what flexibility means. Often it's working time and working place. Uh, and we just felt that there was something new that needed to change uh, about definitions of flexibility such that it was more embracing, uh, that there was more mutuality in the way that the organization and employees could uh, benefit from it um, and think differently about the dimensions of flexibility. So we developed a model called adaptive working, which looks at the two traditional areas of flexibility, which is traditionally about you know, where and when people work. But we think there are also other dimensions um, and, and these are helpful for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is uh, you know, how people work, and that is really to deal with the question about you know, work-life balance, uh, life events, and how they affect the intensity with which people can contribute to their, uh, to their employment or to their employer. Uh, and it could be for a variety of reasons. It's often linked to family reasons, children or elder relatives um, that might need, uh, uh, might need care, um, or, but it could be linked to people wanting to study or training to be uh, an Olympian or, or whatever it is. Um, and organizations are not very adaptive to those sorts of requests. Uh, and we think that the discussion with people about uh, how we work and how we can do that more flexibly is, is fundamentally a fruitful thing. Um, the fourth dimension was really around what people do, um, and uh, I think that's linked to the sort of deconstruction of work and thinking differently about what people's progression can be within an organization. So not necessarily job to job to job, um, but it might be sort of a more open-minded attitude to the way that the 
work that someone does could be adapted or readapted to different working situations or to their own personal preferences. We often hear about this, um, these terms, something called ideals, which are a way of individualizing or personalizing the way that uh, people's careers can be structured. And then the final dimension was really around who does work. And this links back to the first slide and the resilience, which is organizations need to think differently about the talent pools that they, uh, they draw people from. Um, and again, uh, I think what we're seeing is, you know, suddenly when COVID struck was this shift towards remote, remote working, i.e. the one dimension of where became an obsession. And yes, organizations are rethinking about what the where dimension will be when, uh, you know, as COVID uh, recedes. Uh, and we know for sure that organizations will have their own view about working location. Um, and, uh, you know, and some organizations are, are actively encouraging people to come back to their offices and, and others are saying it's actually okay not to. Um, so there is no consistent uh, or clear single reason or out outcome, I think, in respect to this. What we're seeing is lots of different organizational practices. Um, but I do know that what we'll do is start to shift towards uh, back to this sort of model, because this idea of multidimensional flexibility actually gets us to the resilience that we need to have to ensure that what we do is uh, you know, thrive when the next threat uh, comes along. So I'm gonna stop there and um, just want to leave a bit of time for questions. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, and I'll, I think um, I'm handing back at this point really, and then we'll, um, we'll take the questions um, as may have been raised during this process. So back to you, Stephen. Thank you, David, and thank you, Jeremy. Um, we do have a, a few good questions um, that I will put to you, and I know we haven't got that long for this, but we've probably got around five to eight minutes, something like that. Um, so they may seem like, I guess they are more focused around the financial wellbeing aspects, but I think some of the responses might veer actually into your area, David, as well, actually, because there's okay. some quite interesting questions here. I mean, one, one that's come up is, that obviously some companies would would love to pay a higher wage uh, or, or help their staff with financial well-being but you know perhaps they don't have the resources right now or, or can afford it i mean what what are, what would you say to them and and what are the, some of the other ways that that companies can help their employees you know financial well-being but not so much with with the money side but, yeah is there other other things they can do to sort of meet the needs of their employees yeah, I'll, I'll go briefly on that one. And, and the answer to financial well-being isn't just give everyone a 15 or 20 percent pay rise, and, and that takes away the problem. Um, people of all earnings levels have challenges with money. If it's just different perspective you're, you're using, but you know the point about how, where do we start? We haven't got a quarter of a million pounds to build the world's most comprehensive program. Part of this is about repurposing what you've already got. Things like EAP. For example, they often now have much more specialist financial counselling is available rather than just the physical and mental that they used to focus on. Other elements of your benefit programme, the retirement piece even, you know, you can offer and leverage your existing providers to provide some more material. And I think the other piece is, is perhaps if you try and create a focal point, even if it's on a kind of HR intranet, there are a lot of free resources or public bodies like Money Helper, uh, which is a government funded pension wise for people you know particularly in their mid 50s that you can curate and, and organize quite a lot of information to at least give people that starting point to signpost effectively okay um, david is, yes is there anything on your side that would help uh, yeah there's a lot actually um mm. I'll, I'll tell a bit of a story in a minute but i mean i think it, it there is a lot of value in thinking about what the intangibles are and how you can invest differently in in some of those things um, the story is very brief. I was I was working with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF, the charity. Uh, we were helping them build their international pay structures, uh, and we have we had then a total reward model. So I think it's really good to cap try and capture everything in a framework that resonates with your people. Uh, and our model as a starting point was saying, well, there's cash compensation, there are benefits, there's workplace, and there's careers, and those four things really capture everything um, about what it means to work for an organisation. And they said, well, not in our case, because we pay slightly above insulting levels. That's their pay philosophy. Uh, the benefits will get you home if you're injured or killed. Nice. Uh, the workplace is very much about bombs and Ebola at that point. 
Um, and then as far as career is concerned, we, you know, we don't train people. We expect people to come with the uh, skills and capabilities they need to be able to hit the grass uh, ground running. So we kind of, we're kind of <laughs> okay. So, but they have no shortage of people who want to go and work for them because they're a fantastic organization. They said, well, with us, it's all about the purpose. Uh, and I think that's, that's become increasingly true uh, in, in virtually all organizations. They're trying to connect people to the, the good things that the organization does. Um, so that's one dimension. So we have this model, which is now a sort of pyramid with has purpose at the top and the other four things underneath it. And I think it's always, it's always good to probe around those things. The second thing I would say is you need to go and ask your people. Uh, mostly organizations assume they know what it is that their employees will cherish and value. Uh, I think it helps to go and ask. Um, and then, as I say, I think a lot is actually rests in the intangible things. We know that the sort of pay and benefits do, uh, do a good job of attracting people in. But actually, the excitement comes from uh, the opportunity to have a career, uh, and actually, the way you treat people uh, in that process goes a long way to ensuring that um, that they stay and enjoy what they're doing. And at the moment, we see some really interesting areas and things like the work-life balance, the you know helping people with their parental challenges. I think uh, there's a lot going on in those sorts of areas at the moment. So it's not, not, not just about the cash. That's really helpful and very interesting, actually. And it, sort of taking a slightly further step back, I guess, in, in terms of this whole discussion with, with staff, there was someone who, who works clearly in a company in the Gulf or in, in the Gulf state in the Middle East. And they're, they're asking, you know, when, when in, 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 in companies in, in that sort of area of the world, talking to employees about well-being or even financial well-being, is not sort of something that is always deemed appropriate. It's perhaps quite a personal issue, maybe a personal concern, that's something the employer actually isn't particularly seen as having a role in. What would, the, I mean, what would your advice be as a sort of first step, if you like, and to those companies as well that you mentioned, Jeremy, that you, you, you know, obviously haven't taken the step and don't talk to their staff about finance and financial issues. How do you broach it? Where do you start? Yeah, I'm not aware where we are on time, Steve. So I'll, I'll try yeah, very out. quickly as well. Sorry about this. Yeah, there, there. yeah. I mean, the reality of the cultural piece, particularly for global organisations, is massive, and also the maturity of market in terms of educational solutions and services. You could do something about it. it varies enormously. Um, I would say in in certain parts of the Middle East, the, the well-being agenda is moving forward, and, and financial included in that. But perhaps this is a piece about your own corporate culture. A decade ago, no one talked really about mental health in the workplace, and look, look how far we've come on that journey. That's employers changing the dialogue and its employees feeling comfortable to listen. And I think well-being and financial well-being is a little bit in that box as, as well, particularly in, in certain cultures. So it's, it's a bigger job to move forward, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. Great. Well, very helpful. And look, I'm sorry we didn't have longer for questions, but I think your presentations were very valuable. And, and thank you both for your brilliant and insightful look at financial well-being and, and other aspects as well of career and career progression and, and, and so on. So thank you. Uh, next, we'll actually be hearing from Quentin Emery about HSE culture change. So um, do join us for that session. This session will close. Um, but please join us by going to the GoTo event homepage as you have been, clicking on the button for the next session when it goes blue, uh, and we'll see you in a moment or two. Thank you.